so many of you write to me with the dream of living in Italy and this conversation you're about to hear is one I've had, well at least a version of this, about a thousand times since I moved to Italy about 10 years ago. I've often found when Italians are teaching the language they take for granted things that seem normal to them, as all mother tongue teachers do, because they've never had to actively learn Italian, it's just been passive. As someone with no Italian relatives who was self-taught and got to a stage where I was working as a translator and where I feel super comfortable living, having relationships, uh, doing business in Italian, I want to help you by sharing the more colloquial phrases that you will get asked as a foreigner. And they don't sound at all like your grammar book or the app or the lesson it's not with a patient teacher who is enunciating. This is the speed, the inflection, the colloquial phrases that often bewilder most foreigners when they arrive and they lose all hope and think they're terrible at languages and revert to English. But it's not you. You can become fluent. It's just about how you approach your learning of this language. As an English speaker, I'm going to share with you how I used to deconstruct each Italian phrase so that I could keep the conversation going even when I was missing certain words. And to truly make it authentic, I've recorded my Italian husband Guido playing the part of the Italian so you can properly prepare yourself for what being here in Italy feels and sounds like. Parli italiano? Okay, so we begin with a very easy question. Maybe it's your waiter asking someone on a train, a date, your barista, and you think, I can do this. Most foreigners reply, a little, un po'. But I find when you say this, it's actually too little sometimes, uh, because many people don't get the pronunciation right. It's, it's quite staccato at the end because it's abbreviated. Uh, and so the Italian goes straight to using English, assuming that you know nothing. I would suggest replying with ci provo, ci provo, I try. Now, provo translates as I try, and the ci here refers to the subject of the question. So it's essentially like saying, I try to speak it, it being the Italian. This gives the Italian hope that maybe the conversation won't be as stunted as they feared, and then you might hear this. Da quando è che sei in Italia? Now, this is abbreviated, so it usually throws you. You were listening out for the verb arrivato, when did you arrive, but you didn't hear that. Remember that if you ever get da, from, with the present tense, in this case, say, to be, it's usually someone asking about how long something has been happening that is still happening. So it could be da quande che siete insieme. Da quande che siete insieme? How long have you been together? The reason this trips up English speakers is because in English we would add in a word from the past, how long have you been in Italy? Whereas in Italian, the literal translation always keeps us in the present. From when is it that you are in Italy? From when is it that you are in Italy? From when is it that you are together? Da quando che siete insieme? Da quando che siete insieme? How long have you been together? Now, the textbook would teach you da quanto tempo sei in Italia, but I never ever heard this in real life. The abbreviation cutting off the O and joining quando and e, quando I found to be much more common. Now, you could reply da gennaio, from January, da due mesi, for two months, da un po', for a while, da anni, for years. Now, notice how in English we say from and for, whereas in Italian, da can be for everything. If you were to reply per, per due mesi, that would imply you have come over to Italy for two months, but not necessarily respond to the question, which is how long have you been here so far? Now, don't worry if you're a little confused. Part of learning a language, and I've studied quite a few, is being at peace with not understanding everything. It doesn't mean you're a disaster. It doesn't mean you're not cut out for this. Just don't let that wall come up in your mind. Remember that even when you're identifying just one word in a phrase, that is enough to help with your ability to deduce what was being said. And it will be that way for a while until one day you'll wake up and it will just feel easy and natural. I also find learning a foreign language makes us a better listener, more aware, less arrogant, and more engaged in eye contact. 
Let me explain further. Per is for and da, in this case, is more like since. Sono in Italia per sei mesi. I'm in Italy for six months. Sono in Italia per sei mesi. Per sei mesi. For six months. But sono in Italia da un mese. Sono in Italia da un mese. I've been in Italy for one month so far. Sono in Italia da un mese. Sarò in Italia ancora per cinque mesi. Sarò in Italia ancora per cinque mesi. Sarò in Italia ancora per cinque mesi. I will be in Italy for five months more. Sarò in Italia ancora per cinque mesi. Sono in Italia per altri 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 cinque mesi. I'm in Italy for another five months. This is one of the principal questions that you will get asked a million times uh, when you're over here, even if you're just on holiday. So it's good to understand the difference between per and da. Okay, so when you tell an Italian you've just arrived or you're living here, they usually say... E come ti trovi? Literally, how do you find yourself? But it means, how's it going for you? How do you feel? You're probably not prepared for this verb trovare, to find, and then you have the ti, which confuses you because it's reflexive. But listen out for one word, come, how. You would no doubt have heard come stai, how are you. So even if you're not familiar with trovarsi, after telling someone you've arrived in Italy, it's logical to think, okay, they'll be asking you, how do you feel about being here? Bene. This is easy and means good or well. For the more advanced students, you may want to add, è sempre stato il mio sogno vivere in Italia. È sempre stato il mio sogno vivere in Italia. It has always been my dream to live in Italy. Let's break this down. È by itself would be it is. But because you're referring to something which started in the past and is still continuing, we add stato, which is been. Okay, it has always been. È sempre stato. Remember that while in English we need to add to to the verb to live, to eat, to go, Italian doesn't need this. You just use the verb in its most basic form, vivere, mangiare, andare. This is why even though we would say I like to eat, in Italian you just say mi piace mangiare, mi piace, I like, eat. <laughs> so to us it reads like I like eat. Or I like live in Italy. But uh, this is one of the great things. Italian is much simpler than English. È sempre stato il mio sogno vivere in Italia. It has always been my dream to live in Italy. Also remember in for a country, a for a city or town. Okay, think of it like this. Uh, when you get to the airport in Italy, you, you just landed and you're in Italia. But it's only when you get through customs pick up the rental car, catch the train, get lost on Google Maps and finally arrive at the city where you're staying that you pour a glass of wine uh, in your apartment or open your shuttered windows and say, ah, because you are a Roma, a Firenze, a Montepulciano. Sono in Italia, but sono a Roma. Uh, it's the same with regions. Regions are like countries. You say in so in Tuscany, in Toscana, in Sicilia. Uh, but think you haven't really arrived because you've still got to find the little village and work out the terrible directions your B&B host sent you in broken English. So you don't get to say ah until you're in the town or village. Okay, so I'm in Toscana, but I'm a Montepulciano. Okay, going back to our conversation, if you remember, he says, Parlo italiano, ci provo. Da quando è che sei in Italia? Da due mesi. E come ti trovi? Bene, è sempre stato il mio sogno vivere in Italia. And then he says... Come mai? Come mai? Come mai? Why? How come? Why is that? Come? How? And mai, which means never or ever. So it's literally like, how ever is that the case? But I suppose uh, in English it would be like saying, how come? How come? 
Okay, to save you blabbering on and getting thoroughly flustered trying to articulate everything you love about Italy, I find it's easier to just say, non lo so spiegare. I don't know how to explain it. See again here how just the basic infinitive of the verb to explain, spiegare, is enough and they don't add on how to as we would in English. It's the same with I don't know how to drive, non so guidare. Or if someone were to ask, uh, do you know how to sing? It would be sai cantare, sai cantare. It's so much simpler in, in Italian because they just use the infinitive of the verb. And then we have a phrase Italians use all the time for almost every context, sto bene, sto bene qua. This means everything from I'm happy here, I'm relaxed here, I like it here, I'm well here, sto bene, and qua is here. Ma l'italiano lo parlavi già? Okay, in this case, everything at the beginning of the phrase gets eaten when an Italian speaks fast, so perhaps all you get from that phrase is già. You just hear the, the word già. Ma l'italiano lo parlavi già? And già means already. So that gives us a clue that they're asking about the past, something we've already done, uh, and you're speaking about your language skills. So maybe you can deduce that they're saying but you already spoke Italian before, that is, prior to arriving in Italy. But you already spoke Italian. Now, your response doesn't need to include the word Italiano because then you sound like an amateur robot. A more natural response is, Si, l'ho studiato. I studied it. Okay, just, just referring to, the, he's, they've already said Italian in the question, so you don't need to repeat it. You can just say, l'ho studiato. You don't pronounce the H because it's just abbreviated with the L there. So, lo. Uh, if we expanded that out, it would be lo o. But that, that sounds uh, strange, so they abbreviate it to lo. Lo studiato. Prima di venire in Italia. Before coming to Italy. Lo parli bene. You speak it well. And you could say, Grazie, ma non ancora bene come vorrei. Thanks, but not yet as well as I'd like. Or just, grazie, non ancora, thank you, not yet. E quanto ti fermi a Roma? E quanto ti fermi a Roma? This one trips lots of people up. We generally don't spend so much time studying the verb fermarsi, to stay, as much as other verbs like andare or essere, so foreigners often aren't prepared for it. He's saying, how long are you staying in Rome? Implying that you're just here uh, for a short while. E quanto and how long ti fermi, you stay, a Roma, in Rome. And you can clarify that you live here by saying ci abito, ci abito, ci abito. Remember, abitare and vivere are interchangeable for the verb to live, but abitare is more in reference to where you reside. Ah, ok, non avevo capito, pensavo che fossi in vacanza. Here he's saying, oh ok, I didn't understand. But notice in Italian you'll often see hadn't understood instead of non ho capito. Even though ho capito is in the past, people here use it when they still don't understand something. Whereas if the misunderstanding is now clear, they'll say, ah, non avevo capito. I hadn't understood. And then we have a bit of, a, of an advanced phrase with I thought you were on vacation. Pensavo che fossi in vacanza. E che fai? Studi? Lavori? And what do you do? Do you work? Do you study? See how much more complicated and long the phrase is in English. And thank goodness you're not learning this language from scratch. Siamo in pensione. We're retired. Cerco un lavoro nel settore di o della. I'm looking for a job in the industry of uh, fashion. Cerco un lavoro nel settore della moda. Notice how I'm not using the gerund tense uh, the ing tense of looking, sto cercando. When referring to an action that is ongoing and you're not actually doing it in this moment, it's common to just use cerco, I search, I look for. Like studio, I study, but you don't need to say sto studiando as we would need to do in English. I do a lesson a week with a private teacher. Faccio una lezione a settimana con un insegnante privata. Vado ad una scuola di lingue. Vado ad una scuola di lingue. Again, I do, faccio, not sto facendo. 
I go, not I'm going. Get out of the habit of always using the gerund, the ing tense, as we do in English, unless you're performing the action while you're speaking. Next, our Italian uh, understands that we live here, but wants to know when we arrived. Quando sei arrivata? Quando sei arrivato? Quando siete arrivati? Trasferirsi. 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 Learn this verb. It's so useful because everyone asks you when you moved to Italy. Now, it's reflexive, but don't let that fluster you. It's just because you moved yourself. You decided and you literally got yourself up and got your body to the airport. Think of it as I moved myself. Mi sono trasferita a maggio. I moved in May, if you're a female. Mi sono trasferito a maggio, if you're a male. Io e mio marito ci siamo trasferiti due mesi fa. Me and my husband moved ourselves uh, two months ago. Fa means ago at the end there. Io e mio marito ci siamo trasferiti due mesi fa. Io e mia moglie, which is much harder to say than marito, sorry to the gentleman out there, moglie, moglie, uh, io e mia moglie ci siamo trasferiti l'anno scorso. Me and my wife moved last year, l'anno scorso, last year. Many Italians are tired of all the bureaucracy and the difficulties finding work in Italy, so when they hear that you've moved here, they can't understand why that would be your choice. So they say, Ma non ti manca l'Australia? Ma non ti manca la tua famiglia? Ma non ti mancano gli Stati Uniti? So they say, Ma non ti manca? But don't you miss? And then here they insert your country, Australia. Ma non ti manca l'Australia? Un po' sì. Listen to the cadence, not un po' sì. Un po' sì. Un po' sì. Un po' sì. Ma in Italia si vive bene, but in Italy one lives well. To which the Italian will probably roll their eyes and say, ah, I'd go straight away to live in your country if I could. Ci andrei subito a vivere nel tuo paese se potessi. And then they follow up with the classic Italian move of hooking you up with a friend or a cousin or someone who has something you might need. Comunque, se ti serve un appartamento, ti metto in contatto con la mia amica che affitta una casa qua vicino. Comunque, anyway, se ti serve un appartamento, if you need an apartment, ti metto in contatto con una mia amica. Ti metto, I put you, I'll put you in contatto, in contact, con una mia amica, a, a friend of mine, a female friend of mine. Notice how we would use the future tense, I will put you, but Italians often just use the present for something they plan to do very soon. Uh, ti metto. Che affitta una casa qua vicino, who rents a house near here. Now, because you want to be polite and can't be bothered thinking if you have to use the formal lei or if it's feminine or masculine, you can just shorten it to... Uh, grazie, molto gentile, molto gentile, thanks, so kind. Instead of saying you are so kind, you kind of cheat by not specifying the gender or the age of the person you're speaking to. So kind. Ce l'hai un cellulare? Hai un numero italiano? Now you're listening out for numero or telefono when someone asks for your number, but you'll often hear recapito or cellulare, which means cell phone, cellulare, cellulare. You're listening for hai un cellulare, but so many Italians will say the colloquial ce l'hai, ce l'hai, do you have it, ce l'hai. Ce l'hai un cellulare. Maybe you haven't got around to buying an Italian sim, so you reply non ancora, not yet. Ma, but, uso WhatsApp. I use WhatsApp, which is this uh, chat application that 90% of Italians use on their phones. And the Italian closes the conversation with Allora sento questa amica per l'appartamento e ti faccio sapere, ti mando un messaggio. Allora, well then, sento questa amica, I'll hear from this friend per l'appartamento, about the apartment. E ti faccio sapere. And I'll let you know. Now, this is a super common phrase. Don't try to make sense of it with breaking it down into English because it would become to you I do know. Just memorize it. Uh, ti faccio sapere. I'll let you know. Or uh, in the plural, I'll let you guys know. Vi faccio sapere. Ti mando un messaggio. I'll send you a message. Now you want to thank them another time, so you could say grazie ancora. 
Thank you again. Figurati. And then this is a very common response, figurati. It means, of course, don't worry. You're welcome, but it's nothing. Whatever they've done for you, think nothing of it. Okay, how did you go? If you're still feeling in the mood to get yourself on the path to fluency this year, make this year the year you, you become fluent in Italian or really move your language skills forward. Uh, you might like to watch or re-watch my lesson for super beginner Italian uh, when on vacation. Uh, there's my lesson on how to date an Italian, uh, how to order coffee or beverages in a cafe, how to make a restaurant booking, how to order in a restaurant, uh, phrases to use at the beach if you're planning a, a seaside trip to Italy this summer. Don't give up. I can honestly say learning these phrases will expand and enrich your experience of Italy in ways you can't even imagine. Thank you for watching. I shall see you next Friday for another episode of Renovating Our Farmhouse in Tuscany. Alla prossima!